Good morning, Victory Church. Why don't we stand to our feet this morning? Anybody excited to be in the house of God today? Amen. Why don't you turn around and greet somebody sitting next to you, maybe across the aisle from you. Introduce yourself to somebody that you haven't met before. If you're watching online, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Let us know where you're watching from. If you've got any prayer needs at all throughout our gathering this morning, feel free to type those in uh, in the chat. Uh, we've got an amazing team online that's uh, ready to pray with you and for you for whatever it is uh, that you might be needing today. If you're in the house today, I want to let you know that uh, as we're singing together this morning that the prayer team is going to be available on either side of the stage. And so if you have any prayer needs, let me encourage you uh, to go uh, pray with one of our prayer team members. So prayer team, go ahead. Feel free to make your way over to the side of the stage. As we worship this morning, we're going to read out of Psalm chapter 95. Psalm chapter 95, verse 1. It says, Come and let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before Him with thanksgiving and extol Him with music and song. For the Lord is a great God, the great King above all all gods can we worship jesus this morning come on let's worship today come on clap those hands this morning here we go hey. and i was buried beneath my shame who could carry that kind away it was my too till I met you and I was breathing but not alive and all my failures I tried to hide
your slaves. Hey, we worship you. Are you ready? Say, get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Come on, say, get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Come on, say, get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Oh, say, get up, get up, get up. Get up out, prophesy, say, get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave, say, get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave, say, get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave, say, get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave, get up, get up out of that grave, get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. We're going to sing a new song. This song simply says, he lives. all glory and honor belongs to him. How many believe that? Jesus, we thank you, Lord. We praise you, Jesus, God. Lord, you're worthy of the praise, Lord. Jesus, we magnify you. Our Savior lives. Our Savior lives. Yes. I see the tomb of where he lives. The stone rolled away. He is risen. He is risen. He's alive. See his hands. See his feet. Touch his scars and believe. He is risen. He is risen. He's alive. Yes, he is. He is risen.
is alive in me. My Savior lives today. Oh, God, He lives. All honor and power is His. All glory forever. Amen. Jesus. Lifted high 
was my cross you bore so I could live in the freedom you died for and now my life is yours and I will sing of your goodness forevermore worthy is your name Jesus you deserve the praise worthy is your name worthy is your name Jesus you deserve the praise Worthy is your name. Come on, can we lift our hands all over the room? Father, we yield to you, Jesus. For God, you're worthy. There is no one like you, Lord. There is no one like you, Jesus. Come on, can we let the Lord into your heart today? Jesus, there is no one like you, Father. And we're not going to move forward, Jesus. We're just going to sit and rest with you, Father. For there was no one like you, Jesus. Most worthy, most holy one. Oh, Jesus. And now my shame is gone. I stand amazed in your love undeniable. Your grace goes on and on, and I will sing of your goodness forever. Come on, worthy, because worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is, worthy is the name of the Lord.
because you're the only one that matters. I exalt Thee, O oh Lord, O oh Lord. Come on, can we sing this like we mean it? I exalt You, Lord. I exalt Thee. I Come on, let's do that. Let's lift his name. Let's declare his goodness. You are good. You are kind. You are truthful. You are worthy of our praise. We exalt the name of Jesus above every name. And we're so excited that we get to do that together. Why don't you turn around, high five somebody? Because we're going to continue. We're going to stay in an attitude of worship. And we're going to declare today that this is God's day over your life we want to welcome everyone that's watching and joining us online we have people right now watching from kenya we have people watching from springfield missouri and we just want to welcome you to victory today let me remind you we have people that are ready to pray with you if you have a prayer request just step it up and someone will respond to you we're so thankful that you're with us today uh, for those of you that are here if this is your first or second time want to welcome you to palm sunday at victory and we know it's going to be an amazing day but let me let me just get your attention and in, invite you to fill out one of the connect cards that you'll find and the seat in front of you and after you're finished at the conclusion of this gathering you can drop it off by one of the metal uh, uh, boxes that is located at each and every exit or you could take it to our connect center if you need further information so thankful they are with us today absolutely make sure you fill out one of those connect cards uh, we just want to connect with you and let you know about all the amazing things that are happening here at victory one of those being this little thing called Easter. That's next week already. Okay, next weekend. Anybody excited about Easter That's weekend? That's crazy. Here at Victory as we celebrate the resurrection. Want to remind you that our Easter gathering times will be Saturday at 4 p.m. Plus, on Saturday, directly following our 4 p.m. gathering, we'll have an outdoor party. There's going to be inflatables, oh, awesome. face painting, free food, uh, just things for the wait, whole family. Wait, wait, wait. Did you say free food? Free food. Okay. I'm free here. Free food. I'm here. That's all yes. you have to say. Want to clarify on the free? Free. That's it. I'm here. Free food. I got family. You got a family yeah, feed. Uh, I'm coming. <laughs> me too. I got too many kids. Hey, make sure that you get here. Bring your family again Saturday at 4 p.m. and then on Sunday morning as well, 9 a.m. Uh, and 11 a.m. Uh, as we celebrate the resurrection. We've got uh, invite card bundles, and I didn't bring one up here with me, but uh, we've brought, do you have one? No? no. It's all good. We've I brought gave them it up away. here the past few I invited weeks. people to church. I, yeah, see, I'm inviting people. That's why I don't have the bundles on me. Yes. So make sure you grab one of those invite bundles. You can uh, pick one up on your way out today. Invite somebody to come with you to Easter. Don't come alone. Bring some family, bring some friends that aren't a part uh, of, of a church already. Tell them to come sit with you, come hang out with you at the outdoor party uh, next weekend uh, on Easter. Plus, there are so many serving opportunities yes. on Easter as well. There's an opportunity for you to jump in and be a part of what God wants to do on Easter weekend here at Victory. If you want to uh, jump into any one of our dream, dream team opportunities, we've got cards for you to fill out in the lobby go fill one out there's an amazing team out there that's ready to connect you with whatever area you want to serve in so make sure that you get out there fill out a card uh jump on a dream team for easter we need your help we need your help so sign up uh to help out next sunday next weekend as well and grab some of those connect cards you'll get to invite people many of you guys came to church or to know jesus because someone invited you 
So one of the greatest things you could do in, is invite somebody. Over 80% of the people uh, said when a survey was done that if they, if they would be invited to church, that they would attend. This is a non, non-church attending uh, unbeliever. So make sure you invite somebody. Uh, Victor Church, we have now the, uh, the blessing and the honor to bring our tithe and our offering. Let's praise the Lord for that. The highlight for today that we have is a ministry in India. How many of you guys are, uh, have ever been to India before? We don't have that many, but did you realize that most of you are making an impact on India, even in India, even though you haven't been there because of your giving and because of your generosity? Pastor Ma, uh, uh, Thomas Matthew, who attends our OKC campus, is one of our missionaries to India who's there right now. Send us an email with some pictures to let you know the impact that you're making in India right now, all the way from Oklahoma City. He said in his email, we have reached Kerala safely yesterday. The flight was good and the weather is good. This week we are spending time with the family, but starting next week we have a series of meetings planned. Open ground conventions, ministers conference uh, conferences, women's conference, and two church building dedications. Now listen to this. One is Bandarpara Village Church, who is sponsored by Victory Church here. So we're so thankful that whether you're from Great Mount Edmond, Iglesia, or OKC, you're part of that uh, expanding God's kingdom in India. And listen to this. He says, thank you for all your prayers and support for the work in India. I believe 2024 is going to usher in the greatest revival the world has ever seen. They had meetings over 10 different gatherings in towns where some of the crowds reach over 8,000 people. And all because a group of people here decided we're going to be obedient to God's call to spread the gospel and to spread his kingdom. We're so thankful for that. Come on, let's pray and let's thank Jesus that we can be a part of something way bigger than ourselves to reach the lost everywhere around this world. Father, we thank you that we can uh, have a generous heart uh, and through our tithing to our offering to touch people and reach people that we may never meet on this side of eternity. But we're thankful that your kingdom is expanding. We honor you today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. What's up, Victory Church? How are we doing today? Can we make some noise for Jesus? That's how we like to get started. I'm excited to introduce our speaker today, and I want to welcome the Edmond Campus who's joining us and the Grapevine Campus who's joining us. We make some noise for the Grapevine Campus. And those of you watching online, as we heard uh, Pastor Oscar say a little bit ago, we have people right now watching from Kenya and uh, the, whatever else he mentioned. I don't remember what he said. But thank you for watching online, wherever you're, you're watching from. We actually have, I, I wasn't going to do this, but we actually have some guests here that came up for the Seder last night, and they're from the Grapevine Campus. Will you guys stand up? These are your brothers and sisters from down at the Grapevine Campus. So we're honored that they're here. God is expanding our family. And it's like I always say, you can tell when I'm not preaching because the podium's been lowered to a lower height. But today, uh, this is no man that's in, 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 any, in any sense of the word, small stature. Um, Rabbi Jason Sobel is a dear friend that we met a couple of years ago um, through some friends at, at the Gateway Church. And he re- I didn't realize it when we met, but he has a, a long history with the King's University back when I was serving there. And uh, he, he knows Jack Hayford, went back with Jack Hayford, administered and done some work with him, um, some satyrs for their church in, in L.A. So just a, an amazing man. But what you may or may not know about Jason Sobel is the impact that he's having around the globe and how honored we are to have him here with us. So how many of you at, at any of our campuses have watched uh, the Chosen series? Raise your hand, Chosen. It's an amazing, amazing series. If you have not checked that out, you need to watch that. But, but Rabbi Sobel has been involved with that since its, since its, since its infancy, since the genesis of this, this, this program. And actually, he's leaving here today to fly to D.C. to have a roundtable with all of the producers of that show that they're planning the next season. And he sits in as a consultant looking at the scriptures and, the, and making sure that it's being true to the scriptures and those sort of things. He has an amazing ministry on, on TBN, speaks all over the globe, and we're just so honored that he would come and spend some time here at Victory Church. Uh, last night, have you were at the Seder last night? It was a great, great night. Um, I was at the Grapevine campus, so I didn't get to watch it, but I, I watched it online. Uh, just an amazing event last night. And so we, he has some books today. If you want to get a book, those of you at the Evan campus or the Grapevine campus, you can find all these books online on Amazon or wherever books are sold. But I can promise you, you're, you're going to want to write down this website 
if it, you're about to drink through a fire hydrant, I'm just telling you, at the nine o'clock, I'm like, I'm so glad I get to listen to this sermon again because it's so rich. And I kept finding myself going, wait, stop. I needed to digest. I am, I'm still chewing on the bite I just took of that steak. And he's shoving more in. And I'm like, wait. So, so uh, he has so much content on YouTube and all over the place. And so he, a great place to go to just begin getting to know who he is is fusionglobal.org. Uh, you can find him on 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 social media. You can find him on YouTube. You can find him on TBN, a lot of different areas. Uh, he's got some great books today. We sold out. You guys, the, the 9 o'clock bought almost all the books. Can you believe that? So, but we are out of these. So, but this is a great book that I would encourage you. Uh, uh, Rabbi sent me this book. I read it. It's an amazing book. It's called The Signs and Secrets of the Messiah, all kinds of hidden truths and all of the miracles uh, of Jesus. Uh, this is a great book if you're wanting to go really deep. It's called Aligning with God's Appointed Times. The subtitle is Discover the Prophetic and Spiritual Meaning of the Biblical Holidays. So if you ever want to really go, go dive deep into a lot of the Jewish holidays and some of those symbolisms and that, this is a, a great book if you're looking to deep dive. And then a lot of his sermon today will come uh, out of some of this book. It's called Breakthrough, Living a Life that Overflows. And so if this message speaks to you, inspires you, uh, challenges you, you can dive deeper into here. Uh, I want to stop talking and so he can talk more. Come on, Victory Church, we're known for hosting here. Every campus, stand to your feet. Let's give Rabbi Jason Sobel an, an amazing welcome. Let's go. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Shalom. Man, so great to be here with you. Had a wonderful Seder last night, but after four cups of grape juice, I don't know, I'm a little bit out of it this morning. Got a bit of a headache. Always love coming to Victory. Thank you, Pastor John. So excited to see how the ministry is going and heading down to, to the Dallas area. Amazing. India, incredible. But I'm excited to be able to share with you this morning because we truly are in such an important time and season. You know, today is an important day on the calendar. For the Christian calendar, day is Palm Sunday. This is a day that Jesus entered into Jerusalem on the donkey. We talked about the significance of that last year when I was here, but it's also another significant day on the biblical calendar. We'll talk about that. It's Purim, the book of Esther, and it's also significant because we are one month out from when Jewish people celebrate Passover, so it's Passover season, so there's all these appointed times that are crammed into the season. It says the sons of Issachar understood the times and they knew what to do. And it's important that we learn to understand and come into and live into alignment with the times and the seasons. And on the Jewish calendar, we are in the decade 5780. Can you say 5780? Okay, this is the decade of the pay on the biblical calendar. Can you say pay? Pay is the Hebrew letter that represents 80. Okay, so there are no Roman numerals in the Bible. The way that you write numbers is with letters. So the letter 80 is written with the Hebrew letter pay, and pay literally means mouth. So this is the decade of the mouth. So if you have a big pay... It pays to have a big pay in this season, right? So if you got a big mouth, this is your decade. That's the good news. Loud and proud. Don't be ashamed, okay? And it's also the pay is the letter of breakthrough. So this is the decade of breakthrough on the biblical calendar. And when we think about breakthrough and we think about the letter pay, it connects directly back to this time and season, the Passover season. Think about it for a moment. Who's the bad guy in the Exodus story? His name is what? Pharaoh. He begins with the letter pay. Passover begins with the letter pay. Redemption begins with the letter pay. It says the more the Pharaoh persecuted them, the more they broke forth and expanded. That begins with the letter pay, breakthrough, parats, 
in Hebrew. Moses was 80 years old when God called him. And Moses said, I can't go because I am heavy of speech and slow of tongue. I got a problem with my pay, it says in Hebrew, with my mouth. So send my brother Aaron. So at 80 years old, which is the way we write 80 is with the pay, which means mouth. God told Moses to go use your pay, and Moses didn't want to go, but he did go, and God used him to bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. So everything related to the Passover is connected to the letter pay, and one of the things this tells us is that this is a time to come out of Egypt. Okay, how many of you are ready to come out of Egypt? We have to understand is that Egypt in Hebrew is Mitzrayim. Can you say Mitzrayim? Mitzrayim is the Hebrew word for Egypt, and it comes from the word sar, which means a place of confinement or restriction. So Egypt is not just a geographical location. It is a spiritual and emotional state, okay? It's that place that wants to limit our potential, limit our calling. It wants to box us in so that we get boxed out of what God wants to do for our lives. So this is a season where it's time to break through and break out of the box, whether it's the boxes the people in our lives have put on it on us, whether it's the boxes the enemy has tried to place us in, or whether it's the box that sometimes we put ourselves in, it's time to come out of the box. I want you to say, I'm coming out of the box. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're coming out of the box. Say, I won't be boxed in. I'm coming out of Egypt. The Lord wants to bring breakthrough in our lives in this season. The Passover is not just about what God did in the past. It's what he wants to do in the present. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so what he did in the past is a picture of what he wants to do in the present. And when I think about breakthrough, when I think about this decade of breakthrough that we're in, and this year on the Hebrew calendar, 5784 is the year of the open door. So God is opening some doors, which also means there's some transitions that are going on. We're in the midst of a transition in our nation. But to understand this breakthrough that God is wanting to bring in our lives. I don't think there's any better passage, one of my favorite in the Gospels, John chapter 2. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in the Galilee, and Yeshua's mother was there. And Yeshua is Jesus' Hebrew name. And his disciples were also invited to the wedding. When the wine ran out, Yeshua's ima, his mother, said to him, they don't have any wine. And Yeshua said to her, woman, what does that have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Abba Father, we just want to thank you for this morning. We want to thank you for this time of Passover. We want to thank you for the death and resurrection of your son. And because he died and rose again, we can rise above. We can break through. We ask God that you'd speak to our hearts this morning, not just information, but revelation that leads to transformation. May you be lifted up. We pray these things in Yeshua, Jesus' name. Amen. So friends, when there is a detail in the Bible, it's there for a reason. God doesn't waste words. So in John chapter 2, we read he does his first miracle of the water into wine, and he does it at a wedding, and he does it on the third day of the week. Why not the fourth day of the week or the first day of the week? Okay, what's significant about the fact that he does it on the third day? Well, the third day is a day of double blessing. In the creation account, the third day of creation is the only day God blesses twice. Genesis 1.10, Genesis 1.12, he blesses it twice by saying two times it was tov, it was good. And so it's a day that's doubly blessed. For this reason, if you're ever in Israel on the third day, you're going to see weddings taking place all over the place, right? 
So Jewish people still get married on the third day that we might be fruitful and blessed. The third day is also a day of revelation. We're thinking about the coming out of Egypt. God brings Israelites out of Egypt and he brings them to Mount Sinai. And God says to Moses, prepare the people for on the third day, I will come down on the mountain. God revealed his glory. He revealed his power at Mount Sinai and it was on the third day. Well, this miracle that Jesus did, the first miracle, the end of chapter two, at the end of the miracles, it tells us this is the first miracle Jesus did by which he revealed his glory. So it's a day of revelation. And Jesus is beginning to bring the revelation of who he is and the revelation of the kingdom. But there's something more. The third day is also a day of redemption restoration and resurrection, according to prophecy in Hosea. Hosea 6.1, come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us, but he will heal us. He has injured us, but he will bind up our wounds. After two days, he will revive us. And on the third day, he will restore us that we might live in his presence. The third day is a day of restoration. Why is that significant that he does it on the third day? Think about it for a moment. Why does he, why does Yeshua Jesus do this miracle at a wedding? Because it all began at a wedding and it's gonna all culminate at a wedding in the Messianic kingdom, the marriage supper of the lamb, when we celebrate with him face to face in the kingdom. And so he's restoring, as we'll see, what was lost with the fall. And doing the miracle on the third day ultimately is meant to be a sneak preview of his coming resurrection that happened on the third day. So I believe God wants us not to live out of the lack but live out of the overflow. Say to someone, you're, not gonna, you're gonna live out of the overflow. Right, not out of the lack, but out of the overflow. And I wanna look at some keys to living out of the overflow. The first key to living out of the overflow is faith and trust in the Lord. Think about it for a moment. Mary goes to Jesus and the servants and asks him to do something. He says, my time is not yet come. And what is Mary's response? She says to the servants, whatever he says, do it. She's expecting in faith that he is going to respond, even though it seems from his initial response, he's not going to step in and get involved. But faith moves the heart of heaven. And Jesus responds. We said the third day ties back to creation. One of the things we have to understand with, with breakthrough faith is that there are two levels of faith. There is something I call eye faith, and then there is mouth faith. Think about eye faith. I faith is the expression, seeing is what? Believing. But you know what? That is not the deeper level of faith. The deeper level of faith is mouth faith. Think about creation. In the very beginning, the world was formless and void, darkness, chaos. And then God spoke and said, let there be light. And then God saw that the light was good. First, God said it, and then he saw it. That's faith. Faith is even in the midst of the darkness, having the belief in God to call for things that, as, that are not as if they were. We think believing is seeing, but in the kingdom, the opposite true. Believing is seeing. Yeah. Because you'll never see it unless you believe it. And you'll never be more than you have the ability to see. 
Helen Keller said the worst thing is not to be born blind, but to be born with sight and have no vision. Do we have the faith to believe even when it seems impossible? And this is so important because today is a biblical holiday. It is the biblical holiday of Purim. Jews around the world are celebrating the great deliverance God brought through Esther and Mordechai, who saved us from that evil man, Haman. Boo, Haman, right? He's a bad dude, that guy, right? And so, but we have to understand something. The opposite of faith is doubt. Now, Haman in the story of the book of Esther, you can't understand the story unless you understand Haman's genealogy. Haman is the biological descendant of a wicked man by the name of Amalek. Amalek was the first person to attack Israel when they left Egypt. But what opened the door to allow him to be successful in the attack? Right before he attacks them and starts to have success against them, the children of Israel at the waters of Mara doubt God. And they ask this question, is God really among us or not? Doubt opened the door to disaster. We don't want to be a doubting Thomas, right? We don't, we don't want to doubt. We want to believe. And so... Haman is a descendant of Amalek. Amalek is associated with doubt in the Bible because of that incident of the attack. But also, as we shared, every Hebrew letter has a number. That means words have numerical value. The numerical value of the name Amalek also adds up to the same numerical value of the Hebrew word for doubt in Hebrew, safek. The spirit of Amalek, which is pervasive in our world today, which is a spirit of racism, discrimination, it's a spirit of compromise, it is a spirit of doubt. It wants you to doubt God's promises for your life. It wants you to doubt God's goodness. It wants you to believe that God is holding out for you. He wants you to doubt yourself. And the way we overcome, one way we overcome the spirit of Amalek and to have breakthrough is to not have doubt but to have radical faith. And we have to understand that doubt is often rooted in fear. And so God wants to move us from doubt and fear to faith. Say, I'm moving from fear to faith. See, if you want to have breakthrough faith, you have to understand that you have to have faith and trust. Please hear this. Do you know that you can have faith without trust, but you can't have trust without faith? There were 12 disciples in the boat. Only one had enough faith and trust to say, let me step out of the boat, Yeshua, and come to you on the water. Fear wants to keep you in the boat. Faith wants you to step out for him. And so we got to move from fear to faith and from faith to trust. The second key to living out of the overflow, okay, is having chutzpah. That's a Hebrew word. You can say chutzpah. That means holy audacity. It means spiritual boldness for God. And Mary demonstrates great chutzpah, right? Because she's not going to take no for an answer. She's like, whatever my son says, do it. Yeshua, I'm not taking no for an answer. You're going to do something. Friends, when we know God is promised, when there's a promise in the word, we don't Take no for an answer. A faith that has chutzpah is a faith that is willing to take risks for God. The rabbis tell us that the last generation before the coming of the Messiah is known as the generation of the heel. Why the generation of the heel? 
because they're living at the bottom. They're living in the footsteps of the Messiah. But it also connects back to Jacob. Jacob in Hebrew literally means heel. Think about it. How did he get the name? As he was coming out of his mother's womb, he tried to grab his brother's Esau heel and pull him back in so he could be the first out to get the blessing of the firstborn. Jacob had chutzpah, sometimes good, sometimes bad, but he had chutzpah to dress up as his brother to try and trick his father. That's some chutzpah, right? But we need that chutzpah. And that connects back to the story of Esther and the day we celebrate today, right? Because think about it. Why did Haman want to destroy Israel? Because Mordechai the Jew would not bow down to Haman, who was the second most powerful man in the land. Listen, most people, if it means a financial loss to them, will bow down. Certainly, if they think they're going to lose their lives, they'll take a knee. But Mordechai was not willing to compromise because Haman was a descendant of Amalek. He embodied wickedness, racism, oppression, everything that's evil. And Mordechai was like, I don't care what it costs me. I'm not going to bow down and I'm not going to compromise. Where are the Mordechais today? Where are the Esthers that are willing to take the risk of their lives to go before the king and intercede? Where are the men and women? Where are the young people in this room who say, you know what, I'm not going to bow the knee to the crazy ideologies that are out there, right? Back in the day when Israel went in to take the land, you had all the ites, the Hivites, the Canaanites, the Jebusites. Today we don't have the ites, we have the isms. We have the atheisms and the communisms and the secular isms and all these other isms. And what are we going to be willing to take a stand when it's not popular and it costs us something? We can't compromise. We have to have the chutzpah. Now, my oldest son, Avi, when he was about seven years old, he's about he's 17 now was asked to try out for a movie. We live in Los Angeles, so lots of Hollywood people out there. And they said, man, you did the best of all the young actors, but he didn't get the part. And he was really upset. He's like, I was the best. It's not fair. What he didn't understand is that the child was playing in a scene that was a flashback scene of the main character. The adult actor had blonde hair and blue eyes. That's not my son wasn't going to happen. But he couldn't understand that. But I said to him, Avi, listen, in our family, we don't just celebrate success. We celebrate taking risks. Because unless you take the risk, you have no idea what your potential is. You have no idea what God wants to do with you. You are going to fall and oftentimes fail more than you succeed. But in those moments that you succeed, the reward will outweigh the risk. Amen. Listen, we live in a performance culture where we only celebrate the success, but God celebrates the risk. When you risk sharing your faith, when you risk praying for someone who's sick, when you risk being there for a family member or for a neighbor and people think you're crazy to do it because they're a difficult person, right? God will bless that. Because you know why he blesses the risk? Because you can't make the results happen. All you can do is step out and take the risk for God. That's having a faith that breaks through and has chutzpah for him. But then... We have to understand, why is this the first miracle Jesus did? Of all the miracles he could have performed, why is the first miracle the water into wine? Has to be a reason. Well, think about it for a moment. What's the first miracle Moses did? Moses turned the water into blood, but Jesus turns the water into wine. Why? Because he doesn't come to bring death. He came to bring life that we might have it more abundantly. And what's the symbol of the messianic kingdom throughout the Bible? It's the wine. 
Genesis 49, 10, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until Shiloh comes. To him will be the obedience of the nation. They will tie their donkeys to the choicest grapevine. They'll wash their garments in the blood of grapes. His eyes will be dull from wine. So we see wine. The mountains will drip with sweet wine. Amos 9, 12. There's so many verses that talk about, or 9, 13. So many verses that talk about the new wine in the kingdom. What he was doing by turning the water into wine is that he was giving a sneak preview of the coming messianic attraction. And he was restoring, as we'll see in a moment, what was lost in the Garden of Eden. And so that raises another question, another detail. He does the miracle with how many stone pots? Six stone pots. Why not seven stone pots, the number of completion? Why not eight stone pots, the number of new beginnings and transcendence rising above? Why six stone pots? Think about it for a moment. What day was man and woman created? They were created on the sixth day. In Jewish thought, we fell on the sixth day. And as a result of that, according to rabbis, we lost six things. So when Jesus comes and does the water into wine with six stone pots, he's restoring the original fruitfulness and blessing of creation. It is a sneak preview of what is coming in the Messianic age. The rabbis say in the Messianic kingdom, we will drink wine that's been reserved for us from the six days of creation. It's going to be some good wine, right? Hey, I'm sorry if there's any Baptists in the room who don't drink wine. Jesus turned the water into wine. Some people have been trying to turn it back into grape juice ever since. I don't get it. But hey, God bless him. God bless him. You know, we don't have to whine about it. But there's something more. When he dies, the day that we celebrated is called what on the Christian calendar? Good Friday. Friday on the biblical calendar is the sixth day of the week. So think about it for a moment. The six stone pots connect to the day he died, Friday, which is the sixth day. Because in the very beginning, man and woman took from the tree. They couldn't correct what they had done. So what does God do? God puts back on the tree, puts back on the cross for you and me what the first man and woman couldn't replace, God replaces with his son. Think about it for a moment. Why are his hands pierced? Because our hands stole from the tree. Why is his side pierced? Because Eve, the one who led Adam into temptation, was taken from the side. He's making an atonement for Adam and Eve. His feet are pierced because the first messianic prophecy is the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. Satan's the original OG. He's the original gangster. He's like, you think you're going to crush my head? I'm going to nail your feet to a tree and let's see how you're going to accomplish it now. He thought he was foiling the plan of God. He was actually fulfilling it. And what does Jesus have on his head? A crown of, why a crown of thorns? What's the curse of creation? The ground will produce what? Thorns and thistles. He's literally taking the curse of creation on his head to break the curse and to restore the blessing. And we said letters and numbers are interchangeable. The letter six in Hebrew is represented by the sixth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It is the letter Vav. The letter Vav is the most used letter for sure in the first five books of the Bible. Almost every verse from Genesis to Deuteronomy begins with the letter Vav. And it is the conjunction and in Hebrew. It can be used as the conjunction and when it's placed in front of a word. And so... The first place the letter Vav occurs is, guess where? Genesis 1, verse 1. Genesis 1, 1 has seven words in it corresponding to the seven days of creation. 
The sixth word of Genesis 1-1 begins with the sixth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, the letter Vav, and God created the heavens. The sixth word is and, and then you have earth. So Vav is a letter that connects what? Heaven and earth. When we sinned, we broke the Vav. We broke the connection between heaven and earth. Jesus dies on the sixth day to restore that connection. The Vav is actually in the shape of a nail because it symbolizes the nails by which Jesus was put on that tree for you and me on the sixth day to reconnect heaven and earth. And think about it for a moment. When he dies on the cross, think about the symbolism of the cross. One bar represents the horizontal, the vertical, heaven. One represents earth. One represents love the Lord your God. One represents love your neighbor as yourself. And he dies at the intersection of heaven and earth, of physical and material, and of the love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself to demonstrate what that is for us. The great commandments on the cross are being demonstrated to us. He's on the cross for six hours. There's darkness from the sixth hour to the ninth hour. He's pierced in six places, his head with the crown of thorns, his two hands, his two feet, and his side. I mean, man, it even connects to the mark of the beast, 666. See, six is the conjunction and, but six is also the number that represents the physical world. God created the physical world in six days, okay? Reality is based on the number six. Height, depth, and width each have two aspects to each one of them. We won't go into the depth of all that. Okay, but six represents biblically the physical world. One of the things it represents is the number of man. That's why the mark of the beast is 666, because think about it for a moment. Anything you say three times in Hebrew is the most, okay? That's why the angels cry out, as we sang this morning, which I love, holy, holy, holy. The reason why they say it three times is three. When you say it three times, it means the maximum in Hebrew as an expression, okay? It's the ultimate superlative. So 666, three times, is all physicality disconnected from spirituality. That's why it's called the mark of the beast, because you're nothing more than an animal if all you do is focus on your physical needs and you forget that you're also, first and foremost, a spiritual being and have a soul. What if you gain the whole world and lose your soul? It's part of the reason why heaven is paved the streets with what? Is that because God is the ultimate hip hop dude? Like he's icing out heaven. He's got the bling bling going on. He's got the pearly gates. He's got the gold streets because he's got it like that. He's showing off. He's got the drip. He's the man, right? No. Yes and no. He does got it like that. But no, that's not the point. Here's the point. What people will rob, kill, destroy, and sell their souls for is only pavement in heaven. It is a reversal of the values of this world. We're coming to Passover. The Egyptians try to take the gold with them. Look at Tutankhamun's tomb. But guess what? It didn't go anywhere. You can't take it with you. And so we have to understand that we are spiritual beings first and foremost. And this leads us to the practical application. What does God want to do? What does breakthrough look like? Number one is this. God took something ordinary like water and transformed it into wine. It's my New York accent, water, 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 okay? You turn on your faucet, water, water comes out. A good bottle of wine is worth so much money, right? 
He takes something ordinary and transforms it into something extraordinary. And guess what? When you give your life to Jesus and let him work in your life, he transforms you from ordinary to extraordinary. Say, I'm not ordinary. I'm extraordinary. Turn to someone and say, you're going from ordinary to extraordinary. In Messiah, we're a new creation. The old is passing away and the new is coming. Now, let me just say this. We're going to run a few minutes over. Hang in there. Listen. Listen. To go, you know, one of the, you know one of the number one things that keep people from going from ordinary to extraordinary? Say this with me. Imitation leads to limitation. When I was young, I wanted to be like Mike. Mike Jordan. Michael Jordan. So I'd hang out my tongue and try to dunk. I had to lower the hoop first. I'm not Pastor John here, okay? Don't have that height advantage. Listen, if you try and be like somebody else, you can never be who you are. Stop trying to be somebody else. Be you. You're an original. Don't be somebody else. Number two, we have to live out of an abundant, and we have to live out of an abundant life mindset. Think about it for a moment. God does the miracle only when everything runs out. God often lets everything run out. Why? Because you have to come to an end of yourself before God can really begin with you. But so many of us can't move past that reality. We see the lack. We see, the, we see what we don't have. And God wants us to know that there is more than enough with him. He doesn't say fill the pots a quarter, fill the pots halfway. He says fill the pots to the brim, symbolizing the fact that God likes to bless abundantly. Trust him for the overflow. Be generous. We have to learn to see the good. There's two eyes in the Bible. Jesus says there is a good eye and a bad eye. Listen, the bad eye only sees the negative. It sees the pessimist, it's the pessimistic eye. It sees everything that's wrong. It sees the glass as half full. The good eye sees the promise, the potential, the life, the blessing in every person and in every situation. Jesus was the greatest leader to ever live. Why? Because he saw things in people that they couldn't see in themselves. He didn't see the garbage, he saw the gold. And he built people up. See the good, train your eyes, stop looking at everything that's wrong with you and others in the world and the situation and it's going to hell in a handbasket. Listen, God is bigger than all that. Number four. I would never, so think about it for a moment. The word for wine in Hebrew is yain. Can you say yain? Equals 70. The word for I, ayin, equals 70. The word for hidden, sowed, equals 70 in Hebrew. What's the connection? Connection, wine, I, hidden. Listen, I'm not so smart that I could walk by a grapevine and think if I take that grape, pull it off the vine, crush it with my foot, put it in a bottle, leave it on a shelf, and let it sit for a few years, it's going to create something that's way better than the grapes and way more valuable. What does this tell us? Grapes have an inner essence, an inner potential. But the eye has to see past what's on the surface, 70. What's hidden, 70. And that grape has to be crushed and pressed to bring forth the juice. The point is this. There's more in you that's on the surface. But it takes the pressing to bring forth the blessing. 
It takes the pressing to bring forth the promise and the potential that is in you. And some of you like, I don't want to be pressed anymore. Listen, he wants to bring out every last drop that is in you. Amen. Turn to someone who says your pressing leads to blessing. My pressing leads to blessing. And listen, not only do you have to be pressed, you got to be shelved. The wine has to be put on the shelf. How many of y'all feel like you've ever been shelved? It's part of the process. The better the wine, the greater it has to sit. God is preparing you for something. And just in the side, the best wines, the most robust wines, grow in their most inhospitable, rocky soil where they have to fight for their nutrients. It which gives them the robustness. Some of y'all need to embrace the struggle. It won't be forever. Amen. And I just want to say, to have a breakthrough mindset, to have an overflow mindset, we, have to, we also have to believe that the best is yet to come. Yes. They marveled that the best wine was saved for last. Usually you bring out the good stuff first and the cheap stuff later when everyone gets a little shicker, too drunk to tell the difference. <laughs> Friends, a breakthrough mindset always believes that there is something better to come. We got to have a breakthrough mindset for America. We got to have to believe that the best days are not behind us. We got to contend for that until our last breath. Amen? Say, turn to someone and say, the best is yet to come. Yitzhak Perlman was a famous violinist, a great classical violinist. He was playing a concert. In the midst of the concert, one of the strings broke. And he continued, and everybody thought he was going to have to stop. But he remodulated and retuned on the fly and continued to play the entire concert on three strings. Afterwards, he got a standing ovation. How could you do that? It's unheard of. Someone asked him and he responded this. He goes, I'm a professional musician and my responsibility is to make music with what remains. Friends, if you've ever seen him, you understand that he contracted polio as a child. He walked on the stage with leg braces and crutches and he had to unbrace himself and take off all the apparatus to be able to play. So many people with that degree of disability-hating situation, limitation, would not think that they could become one of the world's greatest classical musicians ever. But he did. They understood that when he said, I make music with what remains, he was talking about the disease that he lived with his entire life. That's what gave him the ability to do what he did. Some of you might feel like, man, I'm only playing with three strings. I'm only playing with two strings. I'm only playing with one string, but guess what? With God, even one string is enough to make something beautiful of your life. Even one string is enough to bring forth something that impacts and changes the world when we give it to God, because the promise in him is a life abundantly. The promise in him is a new creation. Your responsibility is to give him what remains, to give him what you got, and to trust that he's going to bless it and do something amazing with it. Amen? Amen. Friends, this is a season of breakthrough. Let's believe God. I just want to close in a blessing. Amen? The ironic benediction, the high priestly blessing, Aaron was commanded to pray over the people, and by this prayer, God would place his name upon the people in Hebrew. Ya'er Adonai 
you and keep you. May the Lord cause his countenance to shine upon you. May the Lord lift up his face towards you and give you shalom. Nothing missing, nothing broken, breakthrough. In the name of Sar Shalom, Yeshua Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Amen. Amen. Mm. Friends, we're in an important season. Jesus entered Jerusalem. Many people threw down their coats and said, Hosanna, Hoshiana, Lord save, salvation. They said, Ben David, son of David. They welcomed him, they praised him. And a few days later, they were nowhere to be found. Listen, if Jesus was alive today, he'd have many fans, but few followers. God wants to bring breakthrough in your life. He wants to bring abundance in your life. He wants to transform you from the inside out. But it all begins, as we said, the first key is faith and trust. And that faith and trust isn't in ourselves or in our own abilities or in anything that we do. Our faith and trust is not what we do. It's what's been done through Yeshua, Jesus, who God sent from heaven and earth, from heaven to earth, who died on a cross, who was buried and who rose again on the third day so that you might be forgiven, that you might be set free, that you might find abundant life, that you might find eternal life, that you might find breakthrough. And he offers this great gift to us and all we have to do is say yes all we have to do is receive it and so God wants to bring you out of the limitations the Egypts that you've been in but the first step is committing your life and receiving Jesus or maybe it is recommitting your life to Jesus because maybe you have walked with him to some degree, but you know that God has more for you. He doesn't just want your words, he wants your heart. Listen, the gospel is free, but it'll cost you everything because it costs you your life be given to him. It's no longer our own. We've been bought and paid for at a price but it's to live for him and to know him. But that's true freedom. So if that's your desire today, I mean, I just want to invite everyone to pray with me and let's just pray that prayer. Say, Lord, thank you, Father, for sending your son, Jesus. Thank you that he died, that he was buried, that he was rose again, that I could be forgiven that I could be set free, that I could find abundant, li abundant life and everlasting life. I give you my life and I receive you as my Lord and as my Savior. Amen. Friends, if you pray this prayer for the first time, I just want to encourage you to tell someone today and let them know we want to celebrate with you. Heaven will rejoice with you. And friends, if you're here today and you know you feel like things have run out, you feel like, man, I need God to show up in my life. I need God to, to, to help me get that breakthrough. I just want to pray for you. 
So if you, if you need spiritual breakthrough, if you need financial breakthrough, if you need relational breakthrough, if you need physical breakthrough, I just want to ask you to raise your hand. And we're just going to lift you up. So Abba, I just want to ask right now, in the name of Yeshua, this season of Passover, this season of breakthrough, I want to thank you that you are the God of the, you are the God of the impossible, that you are the God of the miraculous. And I'm asking God for spiritual healing and breakthrough. I'm asking for relational healing and breakthrough. I'm asking for restoration of marriages, restoration of families between parents and children, God. I'm asking that there be rest reconciliation and between friends. I'm asking this at work. Only you can do. You die to bring restoration and reconciliation. God, I'm asking for emotional healing now. I'm asking for physical healing now. We just declare right now healing in the cross, healing in the blood, healing in Yeshua, breakthrough from diseases and ailments, afflictions and addictions that have been holding us back. I just speak that right now and ask that you would give the victory here at Victory Church. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can we give Rabbi Sobel a hand? Amen. I want to... Um... Yeah, go ahead. It's good. It's all right. Just uh, remain standing. What I, what I want to do, we like to do this at Victory Church, is, is when we have guest speakers, we don't want to just take from them and send them off. We want to put back into them. And what I want us to do before we dismiss is just pray over him. Uh, there, we all have levels of influence. We're all given levels of influence, and we're called to steward those. And Rabbi Sobel's influence is gaining and gaining and gaining and, and growing, not just nationally, but internationally. And with that comes a lot of stress and a lot of things and a lot of, when, when people start looking to you for content and for things like that, it, 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 it's, it's difficult. It can be challenging and we want to bless him and we want to pray over him. We love you. We appreciate you. We believe in you. And so just stretch your hands this way. Let's pray over, over Rabbi. Father, we just thank you for this man. We thank you that he is your son and that more than anything else he does on this earth, he's your son. He starts from that place. But Father, we see the gift and the anointings that you've placed on him, and we are so grateful for it because we receive and we drink from this well. But Father, we pray that you would replenish this well, that you would anoint him, and that Father, as his influence grows, that you would equally give him a, a dose of your anointing and your grace and your peace and your rest and your wisdom, that nothing would ever be from a place of striving, but it would be a place from shalom. So we thank you for what you have done in his life and what you're doing through him and that we get to receive it. And we pray that you would double it, double it, Lord. Give him everything he needs to go to the next level of his ministry, financially, spiritually, physically, mentally, emotionally, everything he needs, Father. We pray that you would go before him and level mountains, we pray that you would be his rear guard as the enemy comes in like a flood, that you would lift up a standard against him. And any target that is erected on his back, that you would destroy it. That the enemy cannot get through the hedge of protection that you have around him. And we thank you for that. Father, we pray over those coming for Easter. Yes, God. God, not just this church, but churches all over the world. God, it's not about a show. It's not about an event. It's about people coming in and receiving Jesus. So God... Open their ears and soften their hearts. Open their ears and soften their hearts as they come and hear the gospel preached. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Hey, I just want to encourage you all. Listen, we talked about risk. Yeah. You know, take a risk and invite someone maybe you think would never come to church. That's good. Yeah. Take the risk and see what God does. That's so amen. good. That's so good. Can we give him another hand? Thank you. We love you. Appreciate you. Thank you, Dave. Just remain standing. We're going to get out of here in just a second. Uh, that was so good, wasn't it? It's like I told you. It's like drinking through a fire hydrant. I think I got about eight sermons out of that. So um, in a couple months, you'll hear me preach some sermons. Like, I know where he got that. Uh, love you guys so much. Easter, be back here next week. Bring someone with you. Here at Victory in Christ, we live life.
Have a good week, y'all.